Who were the ancient peoples of the world? And what did they know? Egyptology tells us that the pyramids were built around 2500 BC. Is there evidence that the pyramids could be much, much older? Has traditional science been able to explain why the pyramids were built? Or is it a puzzle yet to be decoded? geodesic center of the world, at the mouth of the Nile Delta, there are pyramids built by an early civilization clustering at six distinct sites. One pyramid is up a mountain. It can be seen from space. Curiously, the inside is open to the air. What was its function? Most people are familiar with the Giza Plateau and the Sphinx, but are not aware of their connection to the other sites. The sites run parallel to the fertile band along the Nile. Some sites are unknown, isolated in the middle of the desert. Other sites are known, but are only partially excavated. The monumental nature of the sites is hypnotic and stimulates our wonder and curiosity. All the sites show evidence of sophisticated engineering, advanced technology and monumental architecture. Could the ancients have had an understanding of a superior science? Is it conceivable that there's a correlation between the sky and the ground? Why do we understand so little about the Egyptians? We are told their technology was primitive, Yet the temple walls show the ancients making precise calculations. There is plenty of evidence that paints a fuller picture. Let's go and see for ourselves. So here we are on location at Abu Rausch, which is a fascinating site in that it's up a mountain. This is a pyramid like no other, open to the air. This site really debunks the theory of pulling stones with rope to get them up on top of a pyramid in that the stone would have to come up a mountain before it went up a pyramid.
this site is largely isolated and abandoned and many people don't even know it's here. There's no booth, there's no guard, there's nobody up here. And uh, I think it's meant to be largely forgotten because it really comes head to head with the theory about the way the pyramids were built. When you look around the site, you see evidence of small stones that are newer, medium stones, and then the ancient large stones. At Abu Rausch, we can see evidence of machine tool marks. We know the granite came from distant quarries. The polished, concave slabs of stone could not possibly have been made with chisels. This is not the only example of machine tooling. We're now going to go inside the pyramid. We're walking along this ledge. And what we'll see is there's a passageway here that goes down into the pyramid, even though it's open and exposed. So let's go down. If you stand here, all the way through this area, the stone seems to be blackened, and it's, as, it's evidence of high heat of some kind. Um, I tend to think this was going on during the ancient times, uh, but it's still very curious. There's a pit here, and the stone's obviously broken, and I think that they were heating something. This is the northern point of the Band of Peace. It's the top pyramid in a series of 22 pyramids that go from north to south. So we are now north of the Giza Plateau. As you can see on this map of the Band of Peace, all these sites trace the shape of the River Nile. A new theory suggests that the Nile once flowed right in front of the pyramids and the causeways of all the sites touched the river itself. Considering that the Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt, just as rivers all around the world are vital to the cultures living by them, it seems obvious that important sacred structures would be built directly on the river, not eight miles away from it. How long would it take this river to migrate eight miles? Looking at geological time provides yet another clue to finding out when these magnificent structures may have been built. This probably was a seabed and that the mouth of the Nile started here and that moved along in front of all these pyramids. One of the features of each of the sites in this area is that you can see the pyramids of the next site from the original. From here, the volume of the Great Pyramid and the Second Pyramid look the same. When we get to the next site, we see the volumes are obviously different. It's hard not to be amazed by the pyramids of the Giza Plateau. The Great Pyramid covers 13 acres. It was constructed of 2.3 million stones weighing up to 200 tons each. They 
must have had a level of engineering science that it was unbelievable compared to what we have now. Indeed, they managed to have an order of which they based on this so-called cosmic order, which lasted for 3,000 years. No other civilization has done this. Why is ancient Egypt still so mysterious to us? Are we looking in the wrong place? Or are we looking in the wrong way? We look at, at everything through our socio-cultural context, and so it's very difficult for us to look through that and see another possibility for how life could have been. And we also have to be willing to depart from our own traditional ways of looking at things. That's what's really stopping us from understanding the ancients. We may need to reconsider what we've been told and what we think we've seen. For example, instead of thinking that the Egyptians put the causeway at an angle because the Sphinx was in the way, we could consider another reason. At summer solstice, the sun rises along the causeway in front of the Great Pyramid and moves across the sky, setting between the Second and the Great Pyramid, making it hotter in summer. In the winter, the sun rises in line with the Grand Causeway by the Second Pyramid and sets between the Second and Third Pyramids, making a short trajectory, resulting in cooler weather. It appears that the causeways are deliberately pointing towards the rising sun on the summer and winter solstices. Orthodox Egyptologists insist that the pyramids were tombs. Of all of the wild theories floating around the pyramids, the actual wildest is the one that's accepted without question by all Egyptologists, which is that the pyramids served as tombs. All of those concepts about it being a, a tomb are, are nonsense. Of all of the theories for which there's zero evidence, that one has zero squared evidence. In fact, I don't even think there's good evidence that it ever was a tomb for any pharaoh whatsoever. I mean, it's obvious we don't find mummies in the pyramids. And there's no question you can bring up that Egypt that isn't debatable. The Egyptians themselves, in at least one stone tablet and one papyrus, tell the story that ancient e Egypt is much, much older than the Egyptologists think it is. Where the Great Pyramid sits, I believe, is on a much more ancient site. Under the Great Pyramid to this day is the descending passage in the subterranean chamber. I think there's very good evidence that that was carved out in what we would call pre-dynastic times. That goes back to a very ancient date. Based on the hieroglyphics that we have, the second pyramid was in many ways regarded as the primary pyramid on the Giza Plateau. Actually, from many angles on the Giza Plateau, the second pyramid is dominant. The structure underneath it, or the base of it, was older than even the Great Pyramid. There was a platform-type structure where the Second Pyramid is now. You can see from the platform that it's larger than the Pyramid, suggesting there was once something else there. Around the base is a ring of granite red granite, and um, at least uh, from what I've seen in Egypt, this is something that was often used around the bases or on structures when they were renewing them, they were refurbishing them, they were taking older structures, re-energizing them, rebuilding them. It's, it's demonstrable in that this, the second pyramid is very definitely built in at least two stages, the third built in two or more stages, I mean, we really don't at the moment have anything to even provisionally to date them with. With the Sphinx, we do. Looking at the weathering on the Sphinx and the Sphinx enclosure, that weathering was clearly formed by runoff from rain, from precipitation. We have the severe weathering, which 99% of the geologists of the world who've heard 
our evidence concur that it is indeed water weathering and precipitation induced. So it has to have been done by heavy rainfalls in the distant past. And the question then is, how distant was that past? That runoff is coming from up on the plateau, follow up the plateau northwest of the Sphinx, you ultimately hit the Great Pyramid. The natural topography is the water would run down the back of the Sphinx enclosure, and that's where you see the greatest amount of uh, water precipitation weathering. To have that surface hydrology, you need to have the plateau relatively intact. Now, if you look, currently, there's a big quarry interrupting the water flow. So we know that the water flow that was causing that weathering had to occur before that quarry existed. That quarry is well known Egyptologically by inscriptions, etc. That was a quarry that was used when the Great Pyramid was built. So that means that the Sphinx must have been carved earlier. The water was still running off, running down the back of the enclosure wall and causing that weathering before that quarry was a quarry, which means that occurs before the Great Pyramid was built. Basically, we have right there disrupted the traditional chronology. Even Egyptologists agree that the Giza Plateau has a unified ground plan. How does the Great Pyramid display evidence of this correlation? I do think when it was what we would call partially built, it was used as an astronomical observatory. The Grand Gallery, perfectly aligned north-south, opening to the southern sky, would have made a wonderful observational tube, essentially, looking up into the sky. We have shafts pointing to certain stars, Orion's Belt, Sirius. And, uh, we know the stars because they're mentioned in the text. We, therefore, can use precession astronomy to place the stars back in alignment with these monuments, in this case, the pyramids, for example. The Great Pyramid stands exactly at the center of the largest land mass on the planet. Yet, we had no idea of the position of continents until 600 years ago. How could they have known? I've shown that Giza, if interpreted as being Orion's belt counterpart, then the layout of the three pyramids, as they are to the ground meridian, would fit a celestial meridian of these stars at 10,500 BC. They reach the very lowest point in their up and down move. Looking east, you had the Sphinx looking at the constellation of Leo. So you have two major monuments on the same side, looking at constellations that are representative of these features on the ground in the sky. We have evidence that they did it. <laughs> and the alignments were there. Now, could the pyramid builders have been aware of these alignments? Or why not? With this evidence, it would seem that it's time to rethink what we've been told. at Abu Ghraib, you can see that there's no road, no ticket booth, no nothing. This is a very isolated area. And we're going to walk through a mango grove. If you were to get on a camel and ride south from the Giza Plateau, you'd come up over the sand dune and see these other pyramids. So as we approach up here, you see a pile of rubble. But really what it is, is the base of the largest obelisk that ever was in Egypt. Well, here we come up to the platform of the crystal altar. You can see that it's made 
of quartz, if you look up close here, these little bits of crystal are coming right off it. And then we have a laser cut six foot circle in the middle. And then these points, these huge slabs, these pointing to the four cardinal directions, made out of single solid pieces of quartz. So here we have some stone basins that were found by Sir Walter Emery years and years ago. And the Department of Antiquities lined all these up uh, with the idea of maybe bringing them to the museum. And um, they really didn't know what to call them or what they were. So they just decided to leave them here and they've been here ever since. But if you look at the features on these, they're actually made out of quartz crystal. We'll look up close at some of the places, but when there's little fragments that break off, it's actually a hunk of quartz. And there are these little holes inside and they say that they were for animal sacrifices and the blood would drip through. I don't know. I really don't think that's what happened. No one has ever come up with a theory that uh, satisfies me about what they're for. Is there anyone who knows more about this area? Hakim Awian is an indigenous wisdom keeper who was born in the village of Abu Sir. He trained in Europe as an archaeologist. Hakim lived his whole life in the area known as the Band of Peace. The Giza Plateau was his front yard. 1936-37, the Sphinx then was covered with sand up to the neck. And there was my playing yard. There are tunnels I used to walk in these tunnels. In water, I used to crawl some time because it's narrow. At Abu Jarab, we have a crystal altar, round disc in the middle of four, a symbol of Hotep. And the word Hotep means peace and food. This uh, round disc, it's a, a lid on a shaft about 180 feet deep to the level of the uh, ocean. And that is still running water in there and you can feel it while you in the area. These instruments were not found in a line like you see today, it's uh, nine of them, but they found around the area. And there is still some more to be found. And then we have oldest obelisk located in Egypt. Next to that altar, what's left of the, what you call hieroglyph writing, that's a Sufi writing. It has the obelisk and the disk of the sun and words saying the heart of the sun. Ibra. Arriving at Abu Sir, we can imagine the ancient priests and priestesses who trained as high-level initiates here. Just as we have monks, nuns, and priests nowadays, the ancients trained initiates in ritual practices that served the highest good of mankind. Well, here we are at Abu Sir, and it's very obvious you can see the old riverbed. You can see the pyramids of Saqqara and the pyramids of Giza from here. But more importantly, you can see the old causeway and you can imagine that boats used to come along the river and then the high-level initiates would just step off the boat and walk up the grand causeway and through the pillars into the temple, which is in front of the main pyramid. Spiritual connections would nourish the initiates, instilling a sense of peace and purpose. 
These elegant columns are carved from solid granite. There's something about these black floors that you just imagine them being polished and the beauty in here. Similarly, you can see a beautiful black floor in the temple to the east of the Great Pyramid. The rituals of ancient Egyptians were dictated by the stars. For example, the ancients tracked the movement of the most prominent star in the night sky, Sirius. Through watching night after night, season after season, they realized that this star would drop below the horizon and remain out of sight for 70 days each year. Its return was awaited with anticipation because it coincided with the flooding of the Nile. Now, what happens during those 70 days? Well, if you observe the sky, you will notice that the sun reaches a certain point in its apparent cycle along the zodiac. It's somewhere above Orion at the beginning of the 70 days. And it drifts approximately a degree every day towards the constellation of Leo. So the 70 days are bracketed by Leo at a point somewhere above Orion. That point is where the Pleiades are. In the sky, it's very clear. I mean, we know what happens during the 70 days. Now, assuming on the ground that the three stars are represented by the three pyramids of Giza, and that the temple of Heliopolis represents the constellation of Leo, then you have another feature. You have the Nile that separates them both. Similarly in the sky, the sun at the beginning of the 70 days is about to cross the Milky Way and head towards Leo. So if you take the three stars of Orion's belt as being the three pyramids, then you have a scale. You know, you know their distance and therefore you know the stellar scale that you're talking about. And if you use that scale, you work on the same scale, then the position of, the, of Abu Sir fits the Pleiades. And surprisingly, there are five, six pyramids there, and there are six or seven stars there, and they seem to be in a cluster. And indeed, the sun's path is just below the Pleiades. It's not through them, it's just below them. And Odd enough, we find the sun temples just below the Abu Sir pyramids. So we've got sun temple to sun temple. I now call it sun stations. It looks like these were the stations that on the ground the solar king performed these 70 days rituals. A bit like the stations of the cross. Uh, so you can see them in, in a much, much more archaic and grandiose way. The king went along to these stations, if you like, to perform his rituals, his passion. Here we are at Saqqara. This is the famous Sea Pyramid of Josa. Josa is a, a title to the king of the Third Dynasty, 2900 BC, roughly said the books. 
the, the step pyramid is the, located in a big uh, courtyard, much, much older than the pyramid itself. And you can compare yourself with the same eye. You look at the pyramid and you look at the wall, you can see the difference. These chunks of stone in front of Hakim are quartz crystal characteristic of the area. If we go back to the ceiling here, then it reflects the crystal tile on the ground. This is what's left of it. This has been quarried by the natives in the area in the 17th century. We see the remains of a quartz floor at Giza in the temple to the east of the second pyramid. Now I'm pointing the jet pillar, which is symbolizing one of the ancient gods, Osiris. And jet is a word we still use to address the older people, like grandmother and grandfather, jet. It goes back to the story of Osiris and uh, his brother Seth, the bad guy, who put Osiris in a coffin, throw him in the ocean. The ocean took him place, Phoenicia, Lebanon today. And there is the cedar tree grows, and the roots of the cedar tree captured this coffin. Till it has been found by his beloved sister, Isis. She cry, her tears touch his body, and they live together again for a short while, short enough to make a baby with the name of Horus. The story of Isis, Osiris, and Horus is fundamental to Egyptian cosmology. Isis is connected to the star Sirius, and Osiris is connected to the constellation of Orion. Horus is their prodigal son. I'm going to take you now to see that hospital the healing with the sound. Stories about ancient healing techniques were passed down from generation to generation by the elders. Hakim explains how sound played a part in diagnosing and healing patients. That line of construction, you see like uh, three chambers. It's what's left of the, the house of the spirit. And it's a, a healing system with a sound. It's a medical investigation table. And the patient have the right to use either side of the stairs, one on the right, one on the left. So he have to follow, or she have to follow her own antenna to climb up there and choose the point where she stands. Because each point is connected to a, a chick chamber. We have 22 of them, 11 on each side, no ceiling. And when you go inside, you can see a, a niche where the physician put his head in the niche to see what's the matter with his patient laying on this table. And that works with the sound. And the sound the source is running water in a tunnel underneath here. So it's a big map of tunnels underneath here. Let's consider that the pyramid sites along the Band of Peace are sophisticated harmonic structures, not only mirroring positions of the stars, but designed to replicate harmonic cavities of the human body. It seems that the chambers in the pyramids are harmonically tuned to a specific frequency or musical tone. Sound healing techniques were used to restore the patient's body to the correct harmonic within. This is the view of Abu Sir to the north of Saqqara, and here is the view of Dashur to the south.
Here we are on location at the Bent Pyramid. What you'll notice here is that the construction has two angles. Traditional Egyptologists will tell you that the Egyptians were practicing building pyramids. And they started building at one angle, then changed their minds partway through. This is the kind of thinking that paints the ancient Egyptians as infantile and misguided. But is there another way of looking at it? We call these constructions at that area in Dakshur related to king called Sinifrum. At Dashur, there are three pyramids with three burial chambers in each, nine in total. Traditional Egyptology tells us that the entire site was built by Sneferu. If the established story that the pyramids are tombs is correct, why would Sneferu have needed so many? Sneferu would have had nine different possibilities and options for where he would have been buried, which again is illogical. So this comes back to the fact that understanding the Egyptians in terms of traditional Egyptology means that they were misguided and illogical. I don't think this was the case. Now, when you come to the word Sneferu, sin means double. Nefer is harmony, so it's double harmony. It's not a name of a person but it's the energy we get from this construction. Let's consider that the pyramid sites along the Band of Peace are sophisticated harmonic structures. It seems that the chambers in the pyramids were harmonically tuned to different frequencies or musical tones. The Bent Pyramid, it has two uh, chambers for two different sounds. Each chamber in each pyramid then could be exemplifying sound technology with distinct tones creating huge fields of harmonic resonance. At Dashur, we have the Red Pyramid and the Black Pyramid. The Bent Pyramid is covered in white Tura limestone. So we have red, white and black. Maybe this is a clue to the Giza pyramids also having distinct colours in the past. It would seem that the Great Pyramid would have been shimmering white with its casing stones. The Second Pyramid still glimmers red. And the third pyramid has the remnants of black stones. This is the old riverbed where the Nile flowed in times past. Here is the black pyramid. Egyptologists say the pyramid builders were experimenting and they miscalculated, so the pyramid broke apart. Could there be a different explanation? Another pyramid with similar construction, 100 kilometers south of the Band of Peace, is known as the Maidum Pyramid. Today, when you walk around Maidum Pyramid, you'll find out that on the ground is a coat of uh, black color flint. And the, the evidence is this. When you pick up one of these flints, you see it's black at the top, and the bottom is a different color. And there is a catastrophe happen over there. I want you to look at the ground. You can see a coat of smoke affect the, the, the flints on the ground. Maidum is not the only place that looks as though there was an explosion. Look at this giant crack in the solid stone of the Red Pyramid. It would have taken a huge force to crack the solid rock. There is a crack in the subterranean chamber in the Great Pyramid. And there is another one in the Grand Gallery. There are weird chemical burns in the Red Pyramid. What could have caused these? 
Old photos of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid show the stone as black. The room was cleaned and restored, and now we can see the walls of pink granite. The granite sarcophagus has a broken corner, and the wall next to it has a giant crack. What kind of force could have caused this? Is the Department of Antiquities erasing evidence under the guise of restoration? Where did we get the history of Egypt? Herodotus was a Greek historian in the 5th century BC. He wrote from his perspective, with help from local people, and we have been repeating it ever since. Uh, it's a fake story. I want you to know yourself, to, to, to wake up, to wake the senses and, and look carefully what you are looking at. What have you seen of the pyramids of today? That's what's left of it. Being abused, qu people quarry stones from there. Anybody can go and pick up stones and to build a, um, a church, mosque, a house, a palace. It's not uh, taken good care of by our uh, uh, Minister of uh, Culture and the Antiquities Department. I have to say this. The story leaves many questions unanswered. Maybe it is time we use the evidence to reconsider what we've been told. We need to look with fresh eyes and use a different time frame to reconstruct the story of ancient Egypt.